We want to go now to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi. He's at a refugee shelter at the Ukrainian-Polish border. Uh, good afternoon to you, High Commissioner. You have said this is the fastest moving refugee exodus since World War II. What are the numbers now? What are you seeing? As of today, we've passed the, the terrible mark of 1.5 million refugees, and this in 10 days, essentially from Ukraine into five neighboring countries, the bulk here in Poland, where I am now. And uh, if I think of past decades, I cannot think in Europe of a faster exodus of people, not since the end of the Second World War, I would say. What are you seeing in terms of the state that people are showing up at these shelters in? What do they need? First of all, it's mostly women and children because men stay back. Men of military age, which is from 18 to 60, cannot leave the country. They are in conscription and they have to stay there to defend their country. So it's mostly women, children, elderly, many disabled people and uh, they are, above all, frightened, traumatized. These are people that until just a few days ago had a perfectly normal life, and in, in a matter of hours, everything is thrown apart. And they have to be on the road, very difficult journeys, very traumatizing journeys through war-torn Ukraine up to the border, and now here, where they're safe, but of course they're separated from families, uncertain about their future. So I would say that that... Uh, Trauma and anguish is the most defining feature at the moment. There was supposed to be a Red Cross convoy in the south of Ukraine today to help get trapped civilians out. There are reports from local officials, though, that those humanitarian corridors are being fired on. Can civilians safely get out of the country? How many people uh, would be refugees, but are instead displaced and at risk right now. These statistics are impossible to, to, to define precisely because we don't have access. We are, you know, UN agencies and Red Cross are inside the country, but uh, they can not move everywhere. This is why the UN and the Red Cross are trying to negotiate safe passage to the most affected places, like Mariupol, for example. That's the one you're referring to. But up to now, we have not succeeded in getting the necessary guarantees and respect for the ceasefire. That's the only way that we can send convoys in, bring supplies, and if necessary, bring people out. But people are moving also from other places that are even less impacted. Sometimes they move before it happens because they know it might happen to their location. So this is a, an extremely uh, messy situation uh, all over Ukraine. And people here, you see them behind me, are coming from many, many different cities in the country. Uh, who is firing on those safe passages? There is bombardment by the Russian forces. And this is what people are mostly uh, afraid of. Um, yesterday I was in Moldova, another neighboring country. People were coming from the city of Odessa, where there is no bombing, bombardment yet, but sirens have uh, sounded over the day, and people are so afraid that they just leave their homes, especially people with children. They want to bring them to safety. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, High Commissioner, you've been dealing with these record refugee numbers all around the world, even before this happened in Europe. What happens now that you have this massive influx? What does the UN need? I mean, what kind of resources do you need? Well, let me state the obvious first. We need this to stop. We need this to stop because without... Uh, the war stopping, people will just continue to pour out of the country. One and a half million is difficult enough to manage even for relatively stable and prosperous countries in Europe. Imagine, however, if we go further up, and we will, we will, no doubt, if it doesn't stop. Now, for, for the people that are on the movement, first of all, we need to get more supplies inside Ukraine. And for that, we need at least some areas of tranquility where we can deliver help. And then here, for the 
mass of refugees, a lot is needed, you know, uh, any kind of relief supplies, we need cash to help people, we need logistical support. European countries have means and organization, but if this uh, number of people grows, we will need more international support. And at some point, uh, if people stay here for a long period of time, there will have to be uh, other countries offering places to host refugees, even outside Europe. Tell me about that, because there was massive political backlash in 2015 when Syrian refugees poured into Europe. There's charges of racism, of discrimination. Poland, just in the past year, has tried to build a wall to keep refugees out coming from the Middle East, from Africa. What is different now, and what is happening to those refugees? I think uh, there is, of course, at the moment, a colossal emergency. There, is a certain, there are certain geopolitical factors at play. But uh, I, I, I look at the future. And you're right, we've been struggling with convincing Europe to take, to open the doors for more people, not to push back people. But I think that this crisis, and I've said it before, carries an important message that anybody can become a refugee very suddenly and that any country can become a frontline refugee receiving country needing the support of others we work europe is learning fast to work together in so many ways in response to this crisis i hope that this working together will apply to all people seeking refuge in europe not only now which is happening, but in the future as well. Um, the Pope today called for an end to this war and is sending cardinals to Ukraine to help. Do you have any hope that that will help your cause of establishing safe passage? I hope more than that. I hope that that will carry a message of more lasting peace. Of course, safe passages are urgently needed, so I hope it helps with that. But beyond that, we need a more lasting silencing of the guns. The Pope is a great man of peace. And I hope that his, uh, his spiritual power will, will help convey the message that this has to stop. God willing. Thank you very much, Mr. High Commissioner, for your time today. And good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be back in a moment.